Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Geezerology's Wednesday Spotlight. Today, we're going to discuss an album that's celebrating its 50th year on this planet, Hendrix in the West, which was released by Polydor Records in the UK in January of 1972. It was released on Reprise Records, which was uh, Hendrix's label at the time, uh, in February 1972. Uh, this was the first of the posthumous live releases of, of Jimi Hendrix material. I mean, Hendrix had turned up on a few uh, live albums over the uh, previous couple or three years, including the last year of his life, but they were all, none of, none of them were, were, were specifically Hendrix albums. Like he, you know, he, uh, some live recordings of him were on Woodstock compilations and, and uh, a couple of Monterey pop compilations and things like that. But uh, the only live album of Jimi Hendrix that appeared during his lifetime was uh, Band of Gypsies, which was released just a few months before he died. This is the first of the many, many, many posthumous live Hendrix albums that came out. Uh, some of these uh, recordings on this album were by the or from the Jimi Hendrix ex experience, which was uh, included Noel Redding and uh, Mitch Mitchell. Uh, some of these recordings were from uh, Band of Gypsies, which included uh, Billy Cox and uh, Mitch Mitchell. Uh, so it's it's just a, a combination of different things. It wasn't like one cast or anything like that. But anyway, uh, yep, this came out 50 years ago, and Bob has been listening to this album for quite a while, and I want to turn it over and let him tell us all about it. All righty. Uh, thank you, Scotty. <clears throat> so a couple things I want to note about this. As Scott said, the album came out in 1972. Uh, it was on vinyl, obviously, and was a single album package. And the album went out of print in about 1974, I believe, somewhere along there. Yep, that's it. And um, it finally got reissued. And the reissue is different than the original album. They added some songs to it. Uh, what, what I have right now on streaming music on Apple has three additional tracks on it. Uh, there's an interesting history behind the album. Apparently, when it was first released, uh, some, they mislabeled some of the tracks about where they were recorded. And I have read, and I'm not totally up on this, I need to do some more research on it, but apparently some of the tracks that are on the reissue may not be the same tracks that were on the original one something about maybe licensing rights or something. Uh, but anyway, um, it's not a bad album. It's kind of a patchwork quilt because they called it from several different shows. And it's got some different styles mixed into it. It's not a complete concert recording. So you get some different styles of Jimmy here. And I want to do a real quick song by song rundown. Very, very quick. Uh, there are eight tracks on the original vinyl LP. It runs for a little over 40 minutes. Um, it opens with a song called The Queen, uh, which also it was recorded at the Isle of Wight. Uh, Jimmy does a little kind of garbled vocal introduction, and then he does an instrumental take on the British national anthem, God Save the Queen, kind of doing for them what he did for our national anthem at Woodstock. And then there's a partial uh, rendition of the Sergeant, uh, Beatles, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. I think both of these are needless. They didn't do anything for me, and uh, in my opinion, they shouldn't even be on the album. Thankfully, his version of Sergeant Pepper's is brief. Um, there are two cuts on this album that are just absolutely standouts, Little Wing and uh, Red House. Red House is a 13-minute blues barns burner, barn burner, excuse me. I think that showcases Jimmy's blues chops. This does a fantastic job on it. Um, there are three cuts from a concert in Berkeley, Lover Man, Johnny B. Good, and Blue Suede Shoes. Uh, it's kind of uh, 50s rock stuff with Hendrix does. He covers, obviously, you know, uh, Blue Suede Shoes and Johnny B. Good. It's almost like he's just jamming uh, with um, 
you know, the his things. And it's kind of the kind of fun stuff, but a totally different side of Jimmy. Then um, it closes with Voodoo Child, 13 minutes and some bond thing of Voodoo Child. Play it at a really different tempo. He kind of speeds things up. So it sounds different, but it's still played, you know, really brilliantly. So, like I say, it, it's a patchwork quilt because you get several different styles from Jimmy. Um, these subsequent posthumous recordings, you know, we started getting entire concerts, you know, on, on CD or, or streaming release. Like, you know, the entirety of the Monterey Pops concert and things like that. But this is a kind of an interesting little overview. Um, I think it's fun to listen to. Like I say, if for no other reason than Little Wing and Red House, they're just outstanding cuts. Um, on um, streaming on Apple Music, um, In the West has added three cuts, Fire, I Don't Live Today, and Spanish Castle Magic. Those all came from a 1969 show in uh, San Diego. Um, the other cuts originally came from the Isle of Wight, uh, Berkeley, and um, I forgot where the other one came from. Anyway, like I say, in interesting um, cross-section of how Jimmy sounded in concert. And not a bad place if you want to start uh, listening to some live Jimmy. And especially if it's, you know, if you're a younger person and you may not know Jimi Hendrix. If you want to dip your toe into starting out with some live Jimmy, it's not a bad place to be. So that's kind of my quick take. D, what's your take on it? <laughs> okay, my take on this one is, <clears throat> yeah, I think for Jimi Hendrix fans, yeah, this definitely fills the bill. Um, I, I do have to go on with Bob, though, and, and say that it, it is kind of a patchwork of, uh, of live uh, performances and uh, my favorite song of, uh, and well, probably my second favorite song that Hendrix ever recorded was Little Wing. I think it combines a little bit of, uh, you know, it's intricate, it's subtle and powerful all at the same time. Uh, Red House, <laughs> that's an excursion into uh, deep uh, blues. You know, it, it hits all the emotions, I, I think, when you listen to it. And, uh, you know, at one point it's a little bit scary, another point it's exhilarating. And, and uh, you know, these days I have to be in a really certain mood to sit down to listen to any Hendrix, whether it's live or studio. Um, you know, obviously you can't, so much has been written about his place in rock and roll history, the evolution of the guitar. I would just be, you know, doing ditto, but, but yeah, that's all there. And um, <clears throat> some of the other cuts, uh, like, <clears throat> Again, Sergeant Pepper, that was glad he just did. To me, it sounded a little distorted. Maybe the recording uh, equipment they were using wasn't that good and, and all that. Uh, <clears throat> Johnny B. Goody, which was on here, that, that was fun. And I think he's, he's done that in, a, in another album, too. I can't recall which. But, um, yeah, he, he puts so much soul into his playing. Um, you, you can't mistake it. And... Uh, you know, the people that influence him, I probably, you know, B.B. King, uh, Buddy Guy, probably, as far as stylistically, he just took what he heard from them and just went, you know, <clears throat> another galaxy over. But his stage presence, yes, he had a lot of charisma. That comes across in here. Um, I think <clears throat> his, his showmanship, he got good training with that when his very, very early days when he played with the Isley brothers that were a soul, burnt, soul band. And I'm not sure if he played for Little Richard. I, I read this in a couple of places. And, you know, Little Richard, he just about invented showmanship and, you know, makeup and wild styles. So there he was. He had the complete package. And, um, of course, unfortunately, it ended much too soon. But um, some of Hendrick's stuff, Nowadays, for me, it's it's. I don't want to say it's hard to listen to, but uh, some of the things on on um, on here was well, I, I could probably pass it up, but I'll always go back to Little Wing and and this version of Red House. Although I enjoyed the studio version too, so and I think they wanted to not capitalize on his passing, but they wanted to get some stuff out there, and apparently, 
the producer had been had worked with Hendrix for some time, and he was a, a trusted ally uh, in the studio. But that's my take on it. I mean, I I had banded Gypsies, and I for a long time, and uh, I bought that when it first came out. So I'm a little bit more <clears throat> closer to Band of Gypsies. But anyway, this this album, I think uh, of all the post LPs that were released after his passing, I, I think this is w- worthy of it. And unfortunately, there's a lot of bootlegs and a lot of stuff that were re- released in his name that he never probably would have released had he been alive. <laughs> so, and that's my <clears throat> little uh, yeah. take on yeah. Hendrick and the Left. Yeah, thanks, guys. The, uh, uh, the 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 credited there are two guys who are credited as producers on this. It's Eddie Kramer, who was the one that I think Dee was referencing, who who worked with uh, <clears throat> Hendrix when he was alive, and uh, John Jansen is also credited as a producer. I don't know who John Jansen is, but his name is uh, on the album as a co-producer. Uh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm going to be kind of the contrarian here. I've, I've never been in love with this album. I always thought it was okay. And the way it's now re-released, I just, I, I really don't like it at all. Uh, it was, it was just a mess. I mean, this was, this was uh, like, like D said, it was just, they just rushed out. They're, they were just rushing out Jimi Hendrix product, you know, cause he just, cause he just died. And, 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 uh, uh, and what happened? And Hendrix was working on a uh, on a studio album that he intended to do another double album, like he did with Electric Ladyland. And he was working on it, and uh, in the uh, in the studio, and he left a lot of studio recordings. Some of them finished, some of them unfinished. Uh, but then the record labels and whoever his his relatives or his management, whoever was responsible, I'm not sure who, but they released uh, a couple of uh, a, a, a couple of albums right after he died uh, of of some of these studio recordings, and uh, they were called what? They were called uh, uh, the Cry of Love, which was released in March of 1971, and then Rainbow Bridge, which was released in 1971. Which they said was a soundtrack of a movie, Rainbow Bridge, which it wasn't. This was not a soundtrack to a movie. J- Hendrix Hendrix played a couple of uh, songs on stage. They had a couple of uh, clips of Hendrix live in the move in this movie, Rainbow Bridge, but none of that was on this album. This was just all studio stuff that he'd left behind. Um, after that, and those, but those two albums sold very well. They were they were both pretty good product. So they decided to start dumping out, uh, you know, everything they could find. And the Hendrix and the Rust was the first of them. And this thing was just a mess. It was a rush job. First of all, it was called Hendrix and the West, right? And uh, let me go through where some of these were recorded. The, the, the Queen and Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which is the first two tracks on the album, were at Isle of Wight. Uh, I don't know. Did I, was Isle of Wight in the West back in those days? Did, did, did they move the Isle of Wight since then? <laughs> and and then they have they have uh, uh, two tracks on 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 the vinyl LP, Little Wing and Voodoo Child, which were uh, actually recorded at Royal Albert Hall in London. Uh, I don't think that was ever in the West, so I don't know how that lands on an album called Hendrix in the West. Uh, and then uh, Red House was recorded at the San Diego Sports Arena. And Johnny B. Good, Lover Man, and Blue Suede Shoes were recorded at the Berkeley Community Theater. Now, those two last places are in the West or in California. Anyway, that's just, you know, to me, that's just, that's just shows some real sloppiness. The, the 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 list the track listing it's kind of there you can't really see it there because it's kind of faded out but then it's also there well the track listing is all out of order they don't have it in order they've listed track one as lover man track two johnny be good track three blue suede shoes all those are out of order they say it was that way on the uh 
US and the Polydor release and the UK release, right? Now the Polydor release in the UK has the two, the two sides are opposite of what, of what this one is, right? So the Queen and Sergeant Pepper's Little Wing and Red House was on side one, the US release, that was side two on the UK release. It was just, and that always, that always bothers me when you, you know, the whole, to me, and I've never been a big fan of live albums like this anyway, but, but the whole point, I think, of releasing live albums, if you're going to release a legitimate live album, is to, is to have kind of a document of what it's like live. Well, they've just screwed all this up. You know, they, they, they told you, you know, they just, they just screwed it all up. They had inaccuracies and, 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 and things like that in there. The two tracks, Little Wing and uh, Voodoo Child, uh, they say that they were uh, recorded at San Diego Sports Arena along with Red House, but that's not true. Those two tracks were recorded at Royal Albert Hall. Uh, 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 contrary to what it says on the album, well, now when they re-release the album, they couldn't use those tracks on the album because they didn't have the proper licensing for those tracks. So they substituted those tracks for different tracks. Uh, I don't know. That's all, that's all technical stuff, you know, and, and things like that. As far, as far as the music on here goes, uh, I was, I was kind of a fan of Hendrix's uh, studio things, not all the studio stuff, but a lot of the studio stuff. I was, I was, I was more of a fan of his studio stuff than his live stuff. Like, you know, the, the Red House, I've never liked that. <laughs> you know, I just, I'm, I'm not a big fan of, of, of live recordings of long, just instrumental improvisations, which is Red House, what, middle section of red house basically is i just i i don't find it i don't find it interesting the only thing i've ever liked about this album i, I really like this album because it has a johnny b good it's a bliss he does a blistering version of johnny b good on this record and and to me that that in itself that track makes this record <laughs> worth having it's great now uh i recall back in the day there was a video released called Jimmy at Berkeley. And D, I know you've seen this. I, I remember that they used to show this at the at the midnight uh, at the at the midnight showing at that theater in Kirkwood we used to go to on Friday nights. Yeah, the Kirkwood Theater. Yeah. Was it called the Kirkwood Theater? I thought it was called something else. But anyway. Kirkwood Cinema, yeah. Yeah, they used to have uh, they used to have midnight showings of of you know of of you know they they would do Woodstock and and and, and other you know uh, youth culture oriented uh, movies not not all music most of them are, are music but one of them I, re I specifically remember seeing with Jimmy on Berkeley I've since seen that in a couple of streaming services so it was a it was a legitimate thing and and, and it was uh, it was. It was his concert that he did at Berkeley Community Theater on May the 30th, 1970, which three of these tracks came from. And Johnny B. Good is just, I'll, I'll never, I'll, uh, that's always been a highlight to me. That's always been a Jimi Hendrix highlight to me. I just love the way he does that. Blue Suede Shoes, yeah, I don't like his version of that. Uh, there's not much else on this album that I, that I care much except for Johnny B. Good. So I'm going to be a contrarian here. Uh, this was, uh, you know, all the, all the, it, it gets, it gets good. Uh, if you go to all music and Rolling Stone, all the retrospective reviews, they all give it good marks. Uh, I'm assuming that they are reviewing the, uh, the current version of this album, which is, which is significantly different than the original version of it, uh, because they had to replace two tracks and then they added three tracks. Uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, it's okay. Johnny B. Good makes it worthwhile. Other than that, I, mm. I don't have, I'm not, I'm not too big, too big of a fan of this. Uh, and I've, I've never really heard any live Hendrix stuff that I am a big fan of. So, so there's that. Uh, it's just, especially now it's just, to me, it's just, 
it's just a little obnoxious and over the top for my taste. Kind of what D was D was mentioning there that it, it has a that the stuff hasn't worn well for him. Well, I've I've never been a big fan of it, but there you have it. Yeah, I um, uh, as as a counterpoint, uh, Scott, I, I agree with you about the technical aspects of the album. They had a lot of errors on it. <clears throat> And I know that they didn't do a nice job of the European version and the track listings versus, you know, the U.S. version and things like that. <clears throat> and misidentifying where the cuts came from. Yeah, I agree with all of the technical sides of it. It was, it was sloppily put together. But the reason I still like it is it's a easy way to see some of the different styles that Hendrix had in one compact place. And you can see the blues side of him. You can see the rock and roll side of him. You can see the more introspective side of him. And, um, you know, so like I said, you know, the, the sound from those Berkeley shows is completely different than the others. So it's, it's, a, it's a concise way of getting a little bit of an overview of the different styles of Hendrix. So I like it for that, you know, and considering the technological restrictions from 1972 as opposed to what they're able to do now with with some of these things where you know they've been able to put together where they now have entire concerts that you can listen to and they've been remastered and digitally you know brought to life and stuff you know for its time um i think it does give you like i say that interesting little overview of the different styles of hendrix um yeah, I would say my, my thing is that I don't like all those different styles of Hendrix. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, well, you know, I... I that's I, kind of what I'm saying here, is that I didn't like them whenever... That, yeah, I didn't like well, I, these things when they're in yeah. the studio version, and I certainly don't like them when they're in their live version, when there aren't the, the best performances that he's done of them. Well, um, you know, I... There is so much Hendrix stuff out there, you know, that it, it, yeah. it's tough to wade through it all. And, um, you know, and what, you know, <clears throat> what's the best, what's the worst and all that, because, you know, re-releasing Hendrix, Hendrix material, it's like, my God, everybody and his brother wanted to cash in on this guy's legacy. And, you know, I mean, from family to bootlegs, I mean, everybody wanted in on, you know, trying to make a buck off of Hendrix. Um, so, you know, um, I, I, I like the fact that I can listen to, you know, it, I, I, I bypassed the Queen and Sergeant Peppers, you know, I mean, it, the, to me, that was just, I don't even know why that dreck is on there. But anyway, you know, for 35 minutes, I can quickly listen to, you know, several different style, several different styles of Hendrix and, it's not bad in my opinion. And, um, so anyway, that you know, I give it more of a thumbs up maybe than you do. Um, I agree with you. Johnny B. Good's the, the cover of Johnny B. Good here is, is fantastic. I like the blues. So I really like what he does with red house. The, the different take on voodoo child is interesting. So I find a little bit more reason to be optimistic about it than you do. Okay. That's fair. Uh, I find it. It's, and I'm sure somebody that's, you know, young and playing guitar, I'm sure they've heard of Jimi Hendrix and all that. And I don't know if I would recommend this LP for them to listen to. I think I would point to one of the studio albums, either the first one or probably Electric Lady. You know, Electric Ladyland. I mean, that had a, I think his sound, of course, of course it's studio, but he had a lot more, he had more time to round it out and put a fuller sound to it. I mean, um, well, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I don't, I don't think, any, I don't think anything that was released posthumously is is a is a good uh, is a good place no. to start on Jimi Hendrix. No, 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 no. Yeah. E either one of the first three, any one of the three studio albums that he that he actually released while he was alive, it, any one of those three are, are are great places to start with Hendrix. Most of them are good. Uh, Electric Ladyland. It's 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 third one the double album which is just it's pretty sprawling album uh but you know that that's that's to me that's a that's a good example of a double album that would have that that's you know that's 
a good double album, but it would have been a great single album <laughs> if we cut out all the, you know, because about half of that album is I can't listen to. But yeah, but yeah. but about half of that album, which basically would you know would would be a, a, a single album, is 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 great, you know. Uh, all pretty much the entirety of side four is is fabulous on Electric Lady Land, and then uh, and then just kind of pick and choose of a, 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 a couple of tracks here and there on the first three sides, and make one side out of it. And that would have made a great album. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, what he, what, what he did to a Bob Dylan song, you know, of course surpassed. Uh, the you know a simple folk tune strummed on a guitar, and I think. A lot of people think that oh, Jimi Hendrix wrote all along the Watchtower. No, he he reinterpreted it and and bam, to, so something totally new. The same thing Chicago did with I'm a Man. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was it's on that level of uh, accomplishment. And even and even on the even on the Monterey Pop album, the, remember the the Monterey Pop album that came out in 1970. It was one side was Jimi Hendrix and one side was Otis Redding. If you recall, yeah, and 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 uh, uh, and he does uh, he does a version of "Like a Rolling Stone" at the uh, uh, in the Monterey Pop Festival is on that album. That is that, that, that to me he, that, that's as, that's just as good of a, of a of a cover of a Dylan song as all along the Watchtower was yeah. on Electric Ladyland. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you if you want to listen if, to me to me if you want to listen to a live Jimi Hendrix, listen to that uh, uh, that side on the Monterey Pop album where he, he played Monterey Pop, which I, which I think was his first uh, real appearance in the United States, if I recall correctly. Yeah, was yeah. Monterey Pop. That's what really That's, launched his career in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah he he started he kind of created a buzz in England and then came and did the Monterey Pop and that kind of launched him in the U.S. I recall. And that, that was the one that was the one where he and he and uh, he was on the, the who was on the same bill and they mm -hmm. were arguing over which one was going to go first before the other one because Townsend didn't want to follow Hendrix on stage. Right. And Hendrix didn't right. want to follow Townsend on stage. Mm -hmm. So Hendrix decided to take a page out of uh, Townsend's book to to, you know, <laughs> to kind of you know lift himself up, you know, to, to get it to get as much attention instead mm -hmm. of being in Townsend Saddle. And that's, that's the one where at the end of it, where Hendrix uh, pulls out this bottle of lighter fluid and it has a can of lighter fluid out of his pocket and starts dousing his guitar and lighter fluid and setting it on fire. <laughs> Did you know those? Those those movie. There's, a, there's video of that too. There's, there's video of that too. Uh, but, but yeah, but, but uh, uh and, but we're we're going to come back over the next uh, few weeks and uh, and and talk about all three of the uh, uh, studio albums, the Are You Experienced, Access Bold as Love, and Electric Ladyland. We'll be doing that over the over the next few months, over the next few weeks. So so join us for that. But but my take, yeah, Bob uh, Bob gives a, a pretty good thumbs up on Hendrix and West. Uh, D says it hasn't aged well. And I say that uh, I never did like it much in the first place, and it's gotten even worse with the re-release. So <laughs> to, to, to me, it was just it was just a money, it was just a rush job money grab, you know. And that's and that's and that's and it and it and it feels like that to me, you know. Both both from all the mistakes and the documentation, and I don't know, you know, I don't, I just don't think the performances are all that good. Yeah. Uh, yeah, come back in a couple of weeks, uh, probably sometime, I think sometime in February, we'll get to uh, Are You Experienced, the debut album by the Jimi Hendrix Experience. Uh, next week, we're going to, uh, we're going to stick with our run of debut albums. We did Joe Jackson's debut last week, and next week, we're going to do Credence Clearwater Revival's debut, self-titled debut. I think the week after that, we're planning... Uh, uh, the music from Big Pink, which was the band's debut. And we have some uh, pretty cool things coming up for you on our uh, Freeform Fridays. A couple of them are already recorded and are already in a can, and we're getting ready to record a couple more. So all that stuff's coming up. So join us. Uh, hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. And we hope you enjoyed it. See you later, everybody. All right. Take care. Take care. Happy trails.